two quick questions. The first one is, how did you sleep last night? Um, the data says a third of you had trouble. You know, some of you had trouble going to sleep. Um, some of you woke up a lot. Some of you had trouble getting up this morning. If you didn't have trouble this morning, you tomorrow morning, definitely, because you slept in about an hour later than you normally sleep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, sleep and sleep-like processes. This is really important because the Nobel Prize for Science this year was about the mechanism of circadian process. So this is the Drosophila and fruit fly. So um, this is really important. And you know, I really want you to do three things. I, I want you to sort of begin to understand, and I know most of you do, but let's amplify your knowledge of sleep and sleep-like processes. So what is the science behind this? What is some of the pathology that can occur? What goes wrong? And then the third thing is, that I want you to get out of this, is maybe get a little bit more sleep, because you'll be smarter and you'll feel better if you do that. So what, why do we sleep? This is the second question. Why do we sleep? Well, science still doesn't know why we sleep but all living organisms sleep. So plants and bacteria, uh, all living organisms go through a sleep-wake process that's equivalent to sleep and, and equivalent to wakefulness. We don't really know. What we do know is we know a lot of the science behind these sleep-wake processes, and I'm going to share this with you. But first, look at this list of things that go wrong, because a lot of the research that we have done is actually much like nutritional studies. We deprive an animal of sleep and see what happens. And this is what happens. And it's variable. I mean, each of us have different degrees of sensitivity. But, you know, if you don't sleep adequately, if you don't have an adequate quantity and quality and continuity of sleep, and part of that is sleeping when you should sleep and being awake when you should be awake, which we call a circadian process. But these are the things that go wrong. Um, you, obviously, you're sleepy, but you may have micro sleep or automatic activity. People can actually perform activities and not remember that they did it. They're so sleep deprived. Now, of course, memory loss, mood changes, irritability, all of these things occur. Importantly, though, sleep is a fundamental homeostatic drive. Remember, homeostasis means survival. So, in order for you to survive, you have to sleep. If it's that important, then we really need to take care of it. What we know is, for these are actually from animal studies, is that if you deprive an animal of sleep, they will die. They die at about the rate of malnutrition. Now, the good news is it's hard to kill people by depriving them of sleep because the drive for sleep is so fundamental that you can't keep them away. But they are abnormal. Uh, they go through a period of, of an abnormal um, process. So what about the prevalence of uh, sleep disorders? Uh, about a third of us have trouble sleeping, staying asleep. A third of us are sleepy. A third of us are sleepy. Over half are tired, and 20 to 40% snore. So there are a whole lot of tired, snoring, sleepy people out there who can't sleep. And there's a lot of biology behind this particular process. And we call this the circadian rhythm. And as I said, all living organisms have this circadian process, which is actually controlled by a master clock. We know how this clock works, and we also know that it has a lot to do with regulation of core body temperature and actually energy conservation. You can think of us as, at one time as hunter-gatherers, and we didn't have as access to as much food as we needed, so part of the process was we slept part of the time. We didn't need as much energy. So, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the theories behind sleep are actually related to some of these. But it's really important, even down to the immune system. If I give you a flu shot and you know, I sleep deprive you, uh, the flu shot won't work very well compared to if you get a good night's sleep. So it is fundamentally, biologically really important. How does it work? Well, we know a lot about how the sleep-wake processes work. And there's a little clock inside your brain right here, right behind the eyes. It's actually connected to the eyes. So light is really important. So circadian, circa diem, which basically means circling the day, we're 24-hour animals. We're actually 24-hour and 11-minute animals. We're not exactly
exactly 24 hours, but, but our behavior allows us to do something called entrainment. But light is a very strong signal. This particular little clock takes a funny little route and goes to the pineal gland, which we thought at one point is much like your appendix. It's a vestigial gland that has no value. But we know that's where you make melatonin. So these two talk to each other. So when you, in the morning when you wake up, this clock fires and it relays down to areas in the brain, fundamental areas, hypothalamus, brain stem, I'll show you. But these activate neurons which release neurotransmitters which excite your neurons and, and awaken you. So you're programmed to be awake in the daytime. Even when you're sleep deprived, you can function in the daytime because this process is so fundamentally important. Because as an organism, you have to go out and find food and you have to reproduce and you have to protect yourself. And so these processes, biological processes, are important for, for stabilizing this. At night, when it gets dark, your eyes pick up the sunset. And some of you are night owls and some of you are early birds. So there are differences biologically when you respond. But when it gets dark, you, you'll start making melatonin. And melatonin levels will rise and they turn the clock off. So the clock is now off. So these cells, if you put them in a petri dish and you give them enough energy, they'll cycle um, even without light. So intrinsically, um, this biological process is, is programmed into these cells. So this is sort of what happens. Here's the clock, this SCM, called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the biology buffs out there. But this radiates to primitive areas. These are primitive, these, these areas, here's the cortex, where we think. But uh, these are primitive areas, and they radiate out. And, and I put this up here not for you to really study it, but I want you to recognize how complex this is. That there are feedback loop processes. You excite neurons, and these neurons make neurotransmitters. And downstream, they excite other neurons, and then there are feedback loop processes. Sometimes when we take medicines, we affect these neurotransmitters. Almost every medicine that you take, whether it be an antihistamine or an antidepressant, or whether it's a sleep aid, or whether it's a stimulant, or attention deficit problem, these affect these neurotransmitters. They can have either a favorable effect or an unfavorable effect. So we have to, basically, this translates into what we call a flip-flop switch. So this switch, we have state stability. So right now, we are wide awake, most of us are. But all of a sudden, at some point, that's this balance will flip, and these neurotransmitters, which are suppressing sleep, will lose the battle, and we flip over into a, a state where we are, where we get sleep. Um, an example is narcolepsy. Narcolepsy individuals don't make as much hypercretin as they should. So they have trouble with state stability. They're sleepy no matter how much sleep they get. Or we take a patient with insomnia, a patient with insomnia, classic, what we call primary, not secondary, they have problems, they make this inhibitory neurotransmitter which turns the brain off. When you sprinkle GABA on neurons, they, they, they quit firing. Um, some people make GABA, but it doesn't work. It's hard to turn the brain off. So they're kind of stuck on the leg. That's the patient that's insomnia. So there can be abnormalities of sleep-wake processes depending upon some of these disease processes. The other important message is that the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master clock, downstream entrains other organs in our bodies so that they function the way they should function. The other important thing is that each cell, these, these processes are controlled genetically. So you have genes that basically are transcribed and they make peptides and these peptides excite the, the cells to do what they're supposed to do. So if it's your heart, it constricts and you pump better. If it's a, a hormone, you make certain hormones at certain times. So all of these organ functions actually are entrained by the master clock. But the cells themselves have a clock within them too. We think about 25% of cell function, whether it's your skin or your gut or, or your eyes or whatever, have a circadian process. Uh, that is intrinsic within the cell itself. It's just that the master clock aligns them. So this is the master clock 
And you can see as we march through some of these processes, we have a certain degree of predictability about when is the best time for you to work out? Or when are you smarter? Um, you know, every, all of the biological functions, even reproduction, um, the GI tract, when should you eat? All of these are biologically relevant right now. In fact, I've done studies in mice, given them exactly the same food intake and the same physical activity, but if you feed mice late, they get fatter than the ones who eat earlier. So this is an important biological process. And this is how this works. So as soon as you wake up and your neurons are using uh, sugar and oxygen, and if you create a byproduct, that byproduct is called adenosine. So right now your brain is making adenosine, and adenosine, if it goes up high enough, you, you get stupid, you get sleepy and stupid, you can't think, you might get irritable. So we call this the sleep drive. This is the fundamental homeostatic drive. This is why I can't kill you by sleep deprivation. Because in three or four days, you would be delirious and hallucinate, and it's all because of adenosine. Um, so this builds up. When you sleep, you get rid of that. So we have, we have two processes, though. The other process is the circadian drive. So right now, your clock is firing and you have light exposure. And so this circadian drive is accumulating as the day goes on to keep you away. And quite frankly, right before you get sleepy is one of your most alert times. So when we look at this process, it takes you a while to warm up in the morning. A lot of us are looking for caffeine in the morning. It takes our brain a while to warm up. There's a little dip in the afternoon, siesta time. But look how alert we are in the evenings. And we were, you're actually maximally alert right before you get sleepy. It's hard to go that early. It's the way we're programmed. And what do we do? Many of us use electronics. Because electronics, particularly blue light, the eyes process blue light like sunlight. So the sun doesn't set if you have blue light in front of you. And it delays melatonin production. Because as you can see, the melatonin production is at night. At night, the clock turns off, and the drive for sleep diminishes, and then we start over the next morning. So this is called circadian process. This is what adenosine does to you. If you have a high adenosine load, it you know, puts you to sleep, it turns neurons off. And many of us use an adenosine receptor antagonist, that's caffeine. So caffeine is a potent adenosine receptor antagonist. It doesn't get rid of adenosine, it just blocks the signal. So we can disguise our sleepiness for two ways. One is our circadian drive to be awake is so strong that even if you stayed up all night last night, you're, you're aware, um, but you're not normal. And then, of course, we can, we can hit some caffeine and temporarily fight adenosine to help us stay away. So there are all types of pathological mechanisms. I'm not going to go into detail for the sake of time, but there are a number of different disorders where these interactions or these control processes are not normal. And when sleep is not normal or wakefulness is not normal, these individuals have problems with executive function, thinking, memory, reaction times, fatigue-related accidents, mood. Anytime someone's sleepy, we can find a reason for that. And if we can fix that, they'll be smarter, they'll be safer, and their mood will be better. Um, so it's really important for us to protect our sleep and sleep-wake processes. This is one of the devices that we use. It's a super Fitbit. It monitors movement and it monitors light. And this is an example of a patient who's basically free running. So these little, you can see the dark light periods, and it's, it's 48 hours. But these little tick marks are when the individual is moving around. And when there's not, not tick marks, that's when they're asleep. This is obviously not a normal process. This is someone who's we call free running. They're basically staying up an hour later every day. And, um, and some people do that. I see that in some of the individuals who are retired and they essentially sleep whenever they want to sleep and they turn the lights on and, and uh, the light interferes with some of these sleep-like processes. So in summary, we have, we have two processes. The brain has two processes, a homeostatic process and a circadian process that control sleep-wake processes. And, um, and this sort, of, this sort of simply put that these, this clock affects when we make cortisol and it also affects when we make melatonin. And it's really important for us to be careful with late night electronics because those certainly 
modulate the sleep-like process and make sleep um, less efficient. So in summary, sleep is a fundamental homeostatic drive. In order for you to survive, you have to have normal sleep. Without normal sleep, you're not normal. You, you can function though because the circadian drive is there to keep you awake. So respect it um, and get an extra half hour to an hour of sleep tonight because you'll be smarter tomorrow if you do that. Thank you very much.